Oedipus Gottness was educated at the University of Cape Town, where she was awarded a Master of Fine Arts degree and Doctor of Literature degree. She's now a Professor of Fine Art, as I said, at the um, uh, Michaelis School of Fine Art at the University of Cape Town. She studied both fine, fine art, archaeology, and book arts, and has published several essays on the rock art of the sand, the Bushman. Uh, she's um, uh, written many books, including as editor and author, including Miscast, Negotiating the Presence of the Bushman, 1996. Um, which accompanied a major exhibition um, at the South African National Gallery in Cape Town. She has claim to the country, the archive of the Lucy Lloyd and William Bleak, um, and Unconquerable Spirit, George Stowe, and the History of Paintings of the Sand. There are many other kinds of books and many, many exhibitions. I know you'll be very interested to hear her tonight. Marvelous speaker. And then please, the opening is tomorrow at 6 o'clock. The exhibition is up to January 22nd. Come and study it for yourself. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Scottness. Thank Please. You. Some of you might uh, feel you want to go home now because uh, Danny virtually uh, gave the presentation. <laughs> Thank you, Danny. That was a, a fabulous introduction. But uh, those of you who stay, um, I'm going to talk about much of what uh, Danny uh, introduced, and I'm going to start with an exhibit at the South African Museum in Cape Town. Of all the exhibits in museums in Cape Town, and possibly anywhere in South Africa, the South African Museum diorama has generated more debate and argument, as well as pleasure and interest than any other. This compelling view into a world where men and women uh, uh, lived at peace in the early landscape has been a site of expansive and imaginative discussions by tour guides and public about the shape and nature of the Bushmen, their relationship to the environment and to human origins. At the center of the diorama, a man stood posed, poised, a hunter, a bow in hand, alert, ready to aim his arrow. Around him were 12 painted plaster body casts of men and women sitting or lying, and they made up, as the label described, a typical campsite of the 19th century. In the background was an evocatively painted Karoo landscape at dusk or dawn. The diorama drew on an archive, and indeed it is a powerful representation of an archive, but an ineffable archive of popular images of the Bushmen assembled from the fantasies of writers and filmmakers, of mystics, Scientologists, and museologists, all of whom helped create of the Bushmen an analog of humanity at its origins. As a truth, the diorama has always seemed more real by being almost entirely made up. My own view of the diorama has been deeply equivocal. Like many people, I've been compelled by its theatricality. I've been compelled by its ability to draw in the viewer, to encourage a suspension of disbelief, by a deep desire to be absorbed into the landscape and imagine a time and place when people were part of a wildness, alert to the geography of the earth and the seasons and patterns of existence governed by the actions of nature. Such feelings are reinforced by the beauty of its construction, the perfection of the casting technique, the attention to the detail of color and expression, the verisimilitude of the painted backdrop. This kind of response is the result of a superb understanding of the wonder of museum display and the immersion that such wonder produces, a kind of understanding unfortunately found all too rarely in our country's museum exhibits. The diorama, located as it was in a museum widely perceived as one devoted to the natural history of the country, exerted its pull on audiences for several decades. Periodically, and particularly in the late 1980s and 1990s, it provided opportunities for polemical debate about the troubling issues of representation, objectification, racialization, and the marginalization of indigenous people. 
For many, the proximity to stuffed animals and exhibits about whales and dinosaurs suggested that the Bushmen were part of a natural rather than a cultural world. Officially, a people without a history. In response, the museum installed a contextualizing exhibit showing how the diorama was made, indicating that the body casts were made from individuals selected for their appearance and similarity to a popularly held image of who the Bushmen were and what they looked like. But visitors, by and large, ignored this exhibit and the myth of the diorama remained unchallenged. In 2001, London-born Jack Lohman, who was briefly, uh, briefly the CEO of the whole collection of South African museums in Cape Town, took the uh, decision to archive the diorama, as he said, boarding it up and declaring it offensive to many black people. By this, he generated a fever of criticism and comment, both from the public, from tourists and guides, and in academic circles. The only people not upset were the representatives of Bushmen and strands of their descendants who spoke in favor overwhelmingly of the diorama and its location in a museum interested in the world of nature. My own response was one of regret. I thought the museum had wasted an opportunity to use that unusual attraction of the diorama to transform its own rather sadly atavistic displays of race and culture. I was mulling this one afternoon when my phone rang. The call came from the Minister of Environmental, and Tourist, Environmental Affairs and Tourism. The state president, he told me, had never had an opportunity to visit the diorama, and now that it was closed, he would like to see it. Could I arrange for the museum to open it temporarily and give him an opportunity to satisfy his curiosity? Also invited to assist the president in understanding the con controversy surrounding the diorama was an archaeologist colleague of mine, John Parkington. And we met one day along with Jack Lohman, who was dressed in a, a memorable pink suit at the appointed time at the museum. The diorama had not been reopened. Rather, access was to be ga gained through a side door, and it could only be viewed by actually stepping inside it. The experience of being in and amongst the marvelously realistic uh, plaster cast was quite disorientating. The whole diorama was slightly, almost imperceptibly raised uh, when you were viewing it from the outside, so that being on one's level, one was suddenly made aware of how small the figures were, and as the tour guides used to insist, short in stature. Tabo and Becky is also a small man, and I was very pleased to have worn my flat shoes so that I could minimize that sort of looming, towering effect that threatened to overwhelm me. What do you think of the diorama? asked the president. The Minister of Environmental Affairs and Tourism, Valley Musa, had already declared that the figures were no better than experiments in human taxidermy. And I just published an article in the press arguing for its recontextualized opening. I think it represents a powerful and appealing narrative, I said. Really, said Mbeki. And does this narrative represent the truth? Perhaps, I said, but it depends on what truth. If it is a truth, then it is not a particularly politically appropriate one right now. So how, asked the president, would you present another truth and still reopen the diorama? Well, I said, the museum would need to find a way to interrupt the narrative. How would they do that, asked Mbeki. They might, I suggested, find a way to re-curate the diorama, inserting into it something that would refer to the centuries of Khoisan resistance to Dutch settlement, something that might indicate there was another, more historical narrative intersecting with the one of the African Eden. Perhaps a rifle resting against the tree, mistaken at first by the viewer for bows or digging sticks, spent cartridges amongst the stone tools, I privately thought. What do you think might serve that purpose? I asked President Mbeki. He thought for only a minute. How about a figure of a crumpled dead boer shot with a poisoned arrow? 
We chatted for a little while longer, pleasingly challenging conversation. And then almost as quickly as he arrived, he was driven away in his black German sedan. I thought a lot about the president's comment and was drawn in particular to the image of the arrow that would be the agent of death of the Boer in the re-imaging of the di diorama. This was a time in South Africa of brutal farm murders reported daily in the local press. On the one hand, the insertion of this violent act with both a contemporary resonance and reference to the early history of the encounters between Dutch farmers and Bushmen in the seemingly timeless space of the Karoo landscape would be a powerful interruption in the narrative of the diorama. On the other, it signified a permittable form of retaliation, quite at home in the Bushman archive of the popular imagination. The arrow as weapon of the hunter, as if the Boer were some form of prey in the wilderness that represented the Bushman world. Of course, by the 19th century, Bushmen no longer lived in a pristine world of hunting and gathering. Trade in skins, rifles, feathers, ivory and metal had been w well established in their territories. Missionaries had tried and failed to deliver them the good word. By the mid-1900s, ga armed gangs of Bushmen were operating along the northern frontier of the country, actively resisting Dutch settlement, raiding cattle and when confronted, striking back in some cases with gunfire. The Dutch, on the other hand, were actively exterminating the Bushmen, along with herds of antelope and rabbits, small buck and birds that inhabited the country's interior. Whole species were rendered extinct as the Boers shot their way through to the north and east and west. Those Bushmen who were not shot and killed themselves or taken into forced labor were literally starving to death in a parched and increasingly hostile environment. The mid-1900s were thus the lowest ebb for the Bushmen, and yet the diorama promoted and nurtured the popular fantasy of their lives as ones lived outside of history. So powerful was this illusion that when my own later exhibition, Miscast, shown at the South African National Gallery in 1996, presented to the public and to Khoisan communities alike a version of the history of the Bushmen in the colonial era, the response was one of shock and horror. Recently, the museum held another workshop, yet another workshop on the diorama in a quest to find a, a reason to reopen it. By the time I came to present my view on this, I was thinking very differently to the way in which I had been when I imagined one could recontextualize the diorama and interrupt the narrative. My own work over the past decade had been deeply engaged with the lives of the Bushmen living in the Northern Cape and on the frontiers of the colony in the late 19th century. These were the Zam, a people who were the kinsfolk of many of those used to create the castes. We know of these people, their ideas, their histories, their losses, their memories, their oral traditions, through an astonishing archive created in the 1870s by the Cape Town philologist Wilhelm Bleek and Lucy Lloyd, who interviewed prisoners, many of them initially serving time at the Cape Town Breakwater Convict Station. These texts have been the source of my own scholarly and creative work, and I've been laboring on publishing the thousands of pages that constitute the Black and Lloyd archive, and thinking about what they represented of a world view and the ways of knowing and speaking about it that now no longer exists. While I've been working on this, I've had in the back of my mind a statement made by Thabo, the Zam man known by Blake and Lloyd as their teacher, that he wanted his stories to be known by way of books. I've endlessly wondered what this must have meant to a man who himself, a prisoner for the crime of stock theft at near the end of his life, was able to describe the deaths of more than 70 people personally known to him from starvation, cold, from poisoning, from gunshot, from the lash of farmers, from murder and culpable homicide, from overwork and from illness. I think when Clabo told Blake and Lloyd his stories, he knew that his people were facing cultural extinction, 
and that he was losing everything that was important to him. Not least of all, his language itself and the ideas that it embodied. In telling his stories, which in every possible way emphasized the relationship of his people to the very land they were losing, I find it compelling the thought that he must have believed that he would be able to preserve something of what it meant to be Zam for the future, and even perhaps in the hope that one day that being Zam might once again become meaningful. My advice to the museum in thinking about the future of the diorama then was that the greatest responsibility should be to the efforts and memory of Cabo and the others who worked with Blake and Lloyd who wanted to preserve what it was to be Zam for future generations. Ironically, this is precisely what the diorama does. It is an image of seamless interaction with the landscape, of a time before the radical assault on Zam life by settler intrusion, an intrusion, by the way, which included farmers and pastoral stock-owning people. Were the museum able to tell the story of Cabo and the people whose deaths he listed alongside the diorama, then the reopening of it unaltered could honor both the memory of Cabo and represent his image of freedom. It is this image of freedom that is so compelling about the diorama and which I, sh which I argue, in the light of what we, we know of Zam history, should be preserved and celebrated. The diorama has been a preoccupation thus for me since the 1980s, and the question it has raised has given rise to my own creative responses to the archive it represents. How can its strategies of representation be used and subverted to remake the archive on which it draws? Could these strategies be useful in the broader context of remaking the colonial archive and the knowledge systems it underpins? Beginning to answer these questions has meant that I've scrutinized not only the diorama and its strategies of representation and display, but other powerful intersecting archives that are part of its wider resonance. It's easy to see that at least some of the appeal will always lie in the representation of a view into a distant world that we once all shared. It's time and space free from the troubling difficulties of industrial life in which the sorrow and grief that were the foot soldiers of colonization were unimaginable. There is, however, in this view, a fundamental misprision, for the viewer sees the world at once remade and on the brink of catastrophe a catastrophe which we know will occur and which for the figures in the diorama is unimaginable. It is this twin snare in which the diorama traps us, a powerful sense of longing, a sensorial engagement generated by artful recreation and a powerlessness to intervene in what we know will be a devastating end of a way of life. This snare brings us to the here and now of the archive, arousing feelings of empathy, making us feel inextricably implicated in the events that we know will come to pass. This quality of empathy, a fugitive shifting space that it creates, has been at the heart of projects I've undertaken in the past decade. It is a space between the visual and the verbal, and I've tried to draw on an expanded sensorium that engages both linguistic and material. How do these areas intersect? How does the visual function as a site of knowledge? What is the relationship between an archive and publication, between historical detail and the visual evidence of it? How do we factor so small a range of our human senses into understanding the past? How do we, as those who are interested in the past, negotiate a broader world of scholarship, the visual, historical fragments, and written texts? That traditional academic work overemphasizes the written word seems to me to be a problem, as if we should look past the material and the visual, as if its presence was merely an irrelevant vessel for the, con for the textual content. <clears throat> 
The books I have wanted to make have been sensorial as well as textual. My first major project was the exhibition Miscast, which created an environment almost di diametrically opposed to that which the diorama conjured. It employed similar strategies, however, of engaging viewers in a sensorial experience and providing a space in which they were compelled to navigate the archive, as Lloyd described, of the Zahm storytelling bodily. Here, viewers literally engaged with the archive physically, walking over a printed floor of historical records, entering a recreated space of contact between Dutch and Bushmen, walking through the scattered remains of body parts in the form of the fragments of body casts that gave rise to the figures in the diorama, and reading the stories the Zahm told in conjunction with the, exper the experience of their reported destruction. Thus, whereas the diorama occluded all traces of history and intellectual traditions, miscast cast these into leading roles, and the result was an expansive and continuing of an emotional and at times hostile engagement with the issues the exhibition raised from both academics and the public alike. But it is another body of work broadly entitled Real Presence and the Book of Iterations, and in particular three bone books at the heart of this work that I want to focus on now. This project has sought once again to engage in the archive of the diorama, but it has done this by embodying the ideas of producing from one collection yet another, one that will step out of the shadows of the old archive and at once refer to the story of Tabo and his people and the image of freedom and longing to which the diorama gest gestures. Like Miscast, the work depends on conjuring the here and now of the archive, but unlike Miscast, which employed a more narrative strategy, it relies on a broader range of references and an intertextuality which is intended to see the archive of the diorama as one that intersects with several others that are multi lingual, multicultural, multimedial, producing something that might be seen as a fugitive archive, dependent as much on the viewers as the objects of their gaze. The three bone books of the Book of Iterations are titled The Book of Blood and Milk, The Book of the Divine Consolation, and The Book of Speaking in Tongues. Each is the skeleton of a horse, comprised of bone pages attached along the spine, hand inscribed with text, gold leaf, shod in silver, assembled and mounted on a wooden armature. The books are both archives and intended to be read, yet the reading is only possible as a bodily process, a sensorial hunching over and under the skeleton and dwelling on the breech bone, the burnished gold and the red and black lettering. On the one hand, the mounted skeletons refer to the diorama's context of a natural history museum. The texts inscribed upon them to the cultural histories that are the absent present in both the diorama and the museum as a whole. The horses themselves referring to the cart horse of the Karaki Mensa, the Afrikaans speaking descendants of the Zam, which carries the itinerant workers to service on farms that once the preserve of their ancestors. On the other hand, the skeleton refers to the structures of making systems of knowledge, the inscribed text to a history of writing and reading that at once had its origins in medieval meditative processes of transcription and interpretation, and in the state's definition of what constitutes a publication, and therefore what is important for collection in the state archive. The horses themselves refer to the cavalry of the commandos, the steed of the medieval knight, and the horsemen of the Book of Revelations. Each bone book responds too to the visual resonance of the diorama as a space in which the 13 casts cannot fail to recall the ominous and numinous number attending the Last Supper. The hunter, a Christ-like figure to be sacrificed during the domestication of the land, it is this resonance that generated the theme for each of the bone books, 
two of which are currently on show at the Gallery in the Humanities Institute. Drawn from three distinct sources and brought together to produce new, if a shape-shifting, archive. The Book of Blood and Milk is the first of the bone books and was, the skeleton was sourced from an animal centre in Kailitscha, which is a sprawling township outside Cape Town. The horse had been poorly nourished and died relatively young with evidence of exotoses and arthritis. The skeleton was macerated for me by a taxidermist and the bones were dried and bleached. I began by sanding each bone with various grades of water papers and burnishing each one to produce a surface smooth enough with enough bite to accept ink without bleeding. Simultaneously, I was assembling a collection of texts related to a long history of engagement with the Eucharist. For Catholics, the Eucharist is not symbolic. The wafer literally transubstantiates, its own substance being miraculously expelled and replaced with the flesh of Christ, all the while retaining its outward appearance. Catholics literally eat God made mercifully palatable by his appearing and tasting like a wafer, and his body becomes mingled with the blood and guts of the communicant. This was a fusion of two beings, one mortal and one immortal, in Catholic terms, facilitating the cleansing with its purifying flame of the smallest stains which adhere to the soul. But it was also a marriage of flesh with flesh. Eating the wafer was thus a way of collapsing time, bringing the communicant to the very feet of Christ as the past is projected into the present. The physical laws of nature are suspended. More than this, the communicant is offered a deeply carnal relationship with God, the sharing in the physical sacrifice of flesh and its resurrection, a relationship where there is not just a physical union, but a blending and embedding of one body with another. My interest in the Eucharist is twofold. In the first place, it symbolized a space in which a material object could achieve two simultaneous existences, like the here and now of the archive, where the viewer could at once be transported into the imagined Bushman past and firmly placed in the present that was to be its future. In the second place, it provided a richly physical engagement with that space one that was not only intellectual but sensorial, one that was not only about thinking but about feeling. There was a further resonance that made the Eucharist a useful correlative, and that was the idea of sacrifice. In a sense, the inaugural sacrifice that made all others possible, and arguably made possible the massacre of Bushmen by arriving colonists. The texts that were eventually inscribed on the skeleton included, by way of introduction, the Book of Revelations, which is written on the scapulars, and extracts from Dante's Purgatory on the maxilla, mandible, and teeth. The ribs were transcribed with Latin or versions translated into vernacular texts of stories of blood libels from the Reformation, and the experience of women mystics miraculously possessing the body of Christ. The long bones included history of the church fathers and their grappling with the ideas of sacrifice and redemption. And the maid was constructed from linen thread, vellum strings, and bones of small animals killed by farmers or hunters, inscribed with the names of hundreds of women burnt at the stake. Each bone was leafed with gold, 18 or 24 carat, and selected coloring in red. The coffin bones were shod in silver, the patellas replaced with silver plates. The backbone of the book was inscribed with the names and dates of the bishops of Rome from St. Peter, the inaugural pope, to Benedict the 15th, the pope during World War I. All along the upper sections of the thoracic and lumbar vertebra and on the vellum parchments were tags making up the tail. Divine Consolation, the skeleton from this book was sourced from a farm in the Northern Cape, where it had been shot in the chest, shattering several ribs. This is the one that's on show in the museum, in the gallery. In life, 
The horse had suffered from impacted teeth, the roots penetrating the bone of the mandible. It is a more gracile skeleton than the one from Kailich and probably younger at death. It was macerated and prepared in the same way as the first, and the shattered ribs were repaired with a mixed mastic of cement of a gray color. The texts assembled for this horse drew on sources of singular and mass sacrifice. The long bones detailed individual or foundational sacrificial events. The narrative of Abram and Isaac, for example, whereas the vertebra listed major battles of World War I. These are dated and the numbers of dead, places of ships sunk are all included. The ribs were inscribed with Latin prayers for the dead and prayers recited during war burials. The skull includes reference to the poetic work of John Donne and the pelvic bones are, are, are all the words spoken by Hamlet's father's ghost in purgatory. The tail is strung with small bones of mammals and little vials as used by watchmakers, each of which contains a line from an essay by Stephen Greenblatt, which details the troubling matter of the leftover once the Eucharist has been digested by the early modern faithful, and which cross-references the con controversies detailed on the Book of Blood and Milk. The tail is also hung with strips of vellum listing major battles of World War II. The Book of Speaking in Tongues was sourced from a farmer in Pretoria who had to shoot the horse following an accident which left it lame. It was buried and excavated for me a year later, the bones revealing colour traces of the rich iron soil that was its grave. The back of the skull was blown off by the bullet and I repaired it with a single silver casing from which I was able to hang a part of the mane. This was altogether a bigger horse, its legs longer but its head smaller. It had been a race horse of some success before the accident which signalled the end of its life. The text for all these, this horse was assembled from the Blake and Lloyd archive and written in the original Zarm. Several thousand pages were inscribed. Small bones, vellum strips, linen hair make the tail and the vertebra are inscribed with all the names all the names of the Zam individuals about whom we know anything at all. Some of these, of whom photographs survive from the 19th century, are pictured in small silver glass fronted frames, as are the portraits of Lucy Lloyd and Wilhelm Blake. The Zam texts, of course, refer directly to the diorama and to the world of the Zam, but they also stand in relation to the Latin texts. On the one hand, Zam replaced Latin on the crest of the South African coat of arms. On the other, Latin was the language of the Catholic Church, which asserted the primacy of Rome, its near extinction and the adoption of vernacular languages, signaling change and embracing a world of new ideas. Zam on this horse signals death, language death and loss of ideas, the contraction of the world. This contrast extends to the ideas of translatability and the opacity of texts. The visualization of intranslatability and the commensurability of all texts, whether they come from the heart of the empire or its furthest fringes. The bone books are intended to speak directly to the diorama, both by way of contrast and by way of engaging the image of freedom it represents. First of all, they confront the anonymous, ahistorical figures in the diorama. They are real bones from real animals who once lived and died. The figures in the diorama, and are, on the other hand, are casts or copies of men and women who are not intended to appear as individuals, but are rather seen as tropes or, or specimens of a vanished way of life. Secondly, the diorama is the representative of an ineffable archive, contributed to by a horde of unknown and known people who have described and popularized and politicized the Bushmen over several decades, whereas the bone books are an archive of texts assembled from other archives and brought together within the visual vision of one individual. Thirdly, the diorama, whether it's closed or open, 
is an officially sanctioned representation in a national museum, whereas the bone books are an idiosyncratic construction which gesture to a range of concern, many of which lie outside of the content of this paper. Yet despite these differences, I would suggest that the bone books attempt to do what the diorama achieves. They encourage feelings of empathy and foreground the here and now of the archive. In this here and now, they go on to facilitate a process in which the unrecorded, the opaque, the forgotten and the absent in the archive can be conjured into the imagination of the viewer reader where other overlapping archives can enrich the others, where various texts, no matter where they were created, contain an equivalence and a translatability, and most important of all, where an image of freedom, both from suffering and death, but also from the limitations of the archive, is embodied. The texts and the leafing of the bones imply resuscitation, intended to mirror a process in which it is suggested that all archives will become irrevocably desiccated unless a new class of artifact is produced to revivify them and to reach unreachable parts of the past. Thank you. Thank you very much for your uh, wonderful talk. Um, I do have some concerns, though. Uh, your topic is, um, is also a local one here. There's been a little bit of a dispute about our own, one of our own museums here on the U of M campus where a diorama uh, has been taken down because, and this is an actual quote, uh, one of the Native Americans who saw the little figures uh, said that it made them feel small to see these little figures. Now, critics would say, just to be fair, that you could be insulted by someone walking down the street and saying, hi, how are you, in Midwestern parlance, a stranger. But that would only make you neurotic. It doesn't mean that that person who said, hi, how are you, is being offensive. Um, this is what I would call political correctness run amok. In your situation, related with these dioramas, my concern is this. I liked your diorama, uh, especially the one on uh, the floor, where you go beyond just showing what the original diorama that was taken down in South Africa depicts. But where I think you may run into trouble eventually is that you give people who would go and see an exhibit such as this too much credit for being too intelligent, frankly. And by that I mean this. You're speaking to one of the world's greatest universities and their audience here, students, alumni, teachers, faculty, and whatnot. And I'll only speak for myself, but I have to wonder how many people here actually, with regard to the other exhibit, the horses, right? Walking into that, I have a hard time believing that even Einstein would be able to put all those things together and say, yep, that's what this represents. And I th it just seemed too busy to me. And I think that when you then look at the rest of the population who doesn't have the intelligence of a U of M or a Harvard or an Oxford student or graduate, who goes to that museum and sees that exhibit, they're gonna look at it, yawn, and walk out because they don't have a clue. We had the benefit, thanks to you, of you explaining everything. But unless you give them a pamphlet when they walk into that museum, and even a bigger challenge, they actually want to sit down and read the hour that you just spent or whatever it was, explaining it nicely to them, that's going to be a failure of an exhibit. And it's something people here should understand who are in archives. I, I really respect aspects of that that would work. Like, like I said, the one on the floor where you can read history. It goes beyond the mere diorama. But frankly, I guess we'll just have to agree to disagree. The original diorama of the Bushmen, I think that that will be more effective, too bad they took it down, in wetting one's appetite than all the busy work surrounding the horse. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. 
Well, thank you uh, uh, for that. That's, uh, you know, I think you're right and you're wrong. And, and I can say that from some degree of experience. The exhibitions that I've curated, in particular Miss Cast with the printed floor, uh, was one that generated an enormous amount of discussion. And the discussion and debate came from people who normally come to uh, museums um, uh, and, and, and look at those kind of exhibits to people who've never stepped into a museum before, to the Bushman from the Kalahari who hadn't even been in a city before. And, and, and making that exhibition was a real challenge because who was my audience? Was it the intellectual elite? Was it my artist colleagues? Because even the intellectual elite have trouble sometimes with what artists do. Um, was it, you know, was it the Bushmen themselves? Was it the Afrikaners of the, the city or the descendants? Um, and so one, one navigates a very uh, careful, tight uh, rope um, in, in trying to, to think about who one's exhibit uh, speaks to. But what I discovered is you can't underestimate your audience. You can't know what people are going to respond to. And, and even though there are you know, there'll be levels and layers and parts of any exhibit that will, that will bypass any number of people. There are other things that quite unanticipate, you know, quite unanticipate uh, uh, people will respond to. So, I mean, I'm not saying uh, people are going to respond to those horses. I'm not saying they should replace the diorama. But my, 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 my strong feeling, and the, and the diorama hasn't been taken down, it's just been boarded up, and the museum wants to open it again. And the reason they want to open it is because the Bushmen themselves respond to the diorama and want it to be open. It's, it's other people who, who have more political uh, power, who have more access to media, who can, who can promote their ideas that don't want it opened. And it's very complex in terms of uh, South African identity politics, the reasons why they don't want it uh, reopened. But, but my feeling is you need to provide contrast to that. You need to provide other ways in which people, even if they don't understand, can approach something and, and allow it to raise questions. Um, so I think you're right and, you, and you're wrong. And, and I think you're wrong because you can never judge uh, the ways in which people are going to respond to something. Uh, because I know from experience you can't. Well, I can, my question actually starts right at that point, the audience reception being, um, as I looked at that diorama again, and again, you helped us look at it, uh, I, I stopped so much thinking about what I was seeing in the figures and in the landscape and, and being drawn to an imagination of what they were looking at because they were all suspended into looking in a certain direction. And then you said that in your alternative reading, you were making a suggestion about an alternative reading, and I wondered if you had that in mind of, of, of drawing attention or, or helping the, the viewer of the diorama, newly situated diorama, think about what they could all be looking at, looking at in that suspended moment of time. Mm. And um, um, you know, it's a hunter, it's someone cooking, it's a, they're all looking in the same direction. So I wondered also about the, the actual production of this diorama. And if there wasn't, um, let's say, an intended of subversion of the sort of simple representational effect of cultural representation, subversion by the producer or producers of the diorama in having these figures not looking in different directions or attending to their individual project, but all looking in the same direction. Mm. So is there a history to it? There, there is a history, and, and in the description of the original construction of the diorama, the idea was that uh, the, the hunter figure, there's another crouching hunter figure, there are two of them, which in, uh, unfortunately wasn't in my image. Um, but the, the intention was to suggest that a, a buck had just run past, and suddenly there was this mobilization and desire to shoot. Uh, so there's a crouching figure with, with the arrow poised, and then there's that figure, you know, waiting to, to raise the, the arrow. Um, so, the, you know, when it was originally made, that was the intention. 
Um, I th the photograph emphasised that directional um, movement, and, 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 we, and when the museum tried to contextualise it, they sort of had at the end of the gaze a, an exhibit which showed the making of the, the figures and, and tried to show that it was an historical uh, process. But in fact, what they did was they, in showing the making of the figures, they had them all decapitated and dis dismembered. So <laughs> the effect was, was, was sort of counterproductive on one level, but, but the diorama itself was so, so, so uh, compelling that nobody looked at the contextual exhibits. Um, and and I, th I think that that is you know that is a strategy to 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 find a way of producing something at the end of the gaze. And looking at your your uh, horse <coughs> horses there, uh, there's just a multiple multiple number of con conflicting voices and all kinds from uh, the history of the church, various popes and bishops, and over a course of a period of time. Biblical references, Shakespearean references, Christian references, and the horse itself as a part of nature, and bones, and a gilded horse on top of that, uh, with silver hoofs, and all those sorts of things. And it's just one set of meanings and interpretations on another, on another, on another. And, I'm, and I like the idea of, of trying to give more of a sensorial experience to the book. To text, and um, and I like that because I, I, I often feel that text, particularly very, I come from a religious studies background, but sacred text are very sensorial and capture the imagination in so many ways. And we ritualize them, we fight over them, we you know, do suicide bombings over them, everything else. Um, and I'm not quite sure it kind of ties in with the the complexity of what you're communicating here of where to enter in, in my interpretive process here. Uh, I mean, I could see how text on bones has a resonance there. And I even thought to myself, what if you had, even as we see some of these body exhibits that are now touring the world, the exhibition of the body, where the body itself becomes a kind of text with its, these ecorches, you know, they, they're, they're skinless, and what they're saying. But if, even if you had a human bones, a human skeleton with all that inscription on it of how we as human beings are inscribed upon consistently. And we do that today with tattooing and all sorts of things. Um, perhaps as uh, an observer, as a participant, as someone, as he's referred to here, as someone who has a, a modicum of intelligence, as I come into this exhibit, without, how would you help me to enter into the interpretive process here? And not and, and and get past and not get past, or at least to give me some some um, access to the multiplicity of voices that are coming at me all at once. Some, somebody described it as a postmodern blizzard. These skeletons had run through. <laughs> um, you know, I, I'm not sure that you need to know at all. Um, I mean, I, I think I think people. If I had my choice, perhaps I, I wouldn't speak about it in this way. Although you know, there's a catalogue in which some people have said interesting things about them. But I'm not sure that you need to know all that. Um, you know, there are ways in which I think uh, they. And, and I think when one works with objects one finds resonance in many places. Um, when I began to collect those skeletons and make them, there was, there was something driving me to do that, which had nothing to do with anything I've said now. And then as I worked on them, which I've been working on for a period of 10 years, other things became significant and were sort of woven into them, um, all of which to some extent I could unravel. Um, and uh, some of them are, are, are things that would have a broad reference, that would be accessible because uh, particularly in South Africa, the, you know, at the time I first exhibited them or first produced them, uh, there was a lot of controversy about bones and the excavation of bones. Cape Town was 
uncovering graveyards um, in parts of the city that were unknown and there was a, a, you know, contestation about whose bones they were and what should happen to them. So that seen in that context, that would be the point of, of access to, to those skeletons. Um, so in a sense, they, you know, the, the, the point of access shifts and changes depending on where they are. Um, you know, I find the slate floor quite compelling in that space. It's made me think about them differently. Um, but I think for, for most uh, creative work, there is a, a text that someone else has written that provides access to it. And um, a very much, uh, I think, p part of what it becomes is, is somewhere in the relationship between the texts that are produced and the work that's made, the intentions. Can I, can I say one thing? Um, can you believe it then I'll Carolyn, which is, for, for me, it's it, part of what makes this this work beautiful and not just didactic is that it's it's wrong to think that every one of those linguistic strands is essentially and of completeness representational, meaning um, a particular didactic way of understanding a piece to a narrative. Rather, it's like an enormous church polyphony, which brings the dead horse to sing or speak, meaning it's a way of making something happen rather than having a series of intellectual strands, each of which contributes to an analytical story, I think. And even though there's an analytical story there, part of what makes it beautiful is precisely the, the visual polyphony. I mean, so, so in a way, it, it is more like a church service, actually, than it is a series of intellectual elements. Yeah. Oh, Carolyn, you have your hand. I wanted to say that I've grown up in a world that uh, required me to to think of something, for, to think of the Bushmen, the Catholic Church, history, the commemorative practices involved in all of those areas as very separate one from the other. It shocks me to suddenly see them thrown together like that, to have those barriers pulled away. And the minute the barriers are pulled away, I have to think, how did those barriers get there? What, what made me think that they were natural and appropriate? What happens when I start to think of things that were subjected to categories of difference as possibly, not necessarily, but possibly joined together in different ways and ways that I haven't been allowed to think about them? And that for me has been the shocking realization of these burn books. Yes, please. I, um, I just want to ask you if you could talk a little bit about um, the technique of, of writing on the bones. The bones, they're just so incredibly beautiful. And I look at them and I think, how the heck did she do that? Could you talk a little bit about uh, that process and how you came to it and hmm. how it changed maybe? Um, you know, as I said, I prepared those, but I, I, I was trained as an etcher. So, you know, I, you prepare a, a copper surface, for example, shine it until it's mirror bright. Um, and, and I did the same with those bones. They were sort of burnished almost. And then um, I, I used a, a, a pigment-based ink in a, in a sort of mapping pen. And, and I had good eyesight at the time, actually. <laughs> Didn't need glasses. Um, and, and then I just, you know, I used to carry a bone around with me almost every, you know, there was one in my handbag <laughs> for, you know, wherever I was. Uh, the first horse, in fact, I, I'd almost completed writing before um, I realized I'd been using the wrong ink and I had to then sand the whole thing off again and start <laughs> again. But, um, so I did it, you know, bone by bone. Um, and and um, it, it was it was a fabulous process. It was wonderful. It was you know particularly when I, st I started with the Book of Revelations, and that was just copying. And it was uh, you know I felt like a monk after a while. It was there was this rhythmic sort of pleasing, um, almost painful desire to you know perfectly transcribe every word that was in front of me. Um, and so, yeah, so I did it bone by bone and then, and then shellacked them and leafed them and colored them. Did you know you were going to do three horses when you started? Well, there's, there are four, really, but the fourth one I'm still fiddling on at home. 
Yes, no, I, I, th I thought of doing four. And then, in fact, once uh, people started to, to know I was doing this, I, I, I had people sometimes arrive at a conference. A farmer once came to a conference. He, was listening, and he had two bags for me, black bags. And I said, what are these, Nick? And there were two baboons that had died on his farm. And then, you know, people brought me an eland, and I've got several uh, kudus and a zebra. And, um, <laughs> And, and, and a lot of um, um, smaller bucks, hyraxes, rock rabbits, um, some of which I've written on, but not all of them. Can I just ask another question? If you were carrying the bones around, you know, one at a time, then did, did you have a conception of when the skeleton was put together? How, because in some of the joints and stuff, they're just so beautiful, the way the writing and the gilding fit together. And, you must have known that. Yes, I, I, did, I planned, you know, the text ran up the legs and, and um, across the, 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 the spine. So those were planned. Um, and then I had a, um, a little book on how to put together a horse skeleton. <laughs> it's just incredibly beautiful. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you. if you saw yourself as part of that process of appropriating and creating a translation and your process became part of that history, or, or whether it was just an isolated creative process of your own, or if you, if you really saw that same progression that I felt once I was in the room uh, of all of these voices and stories and objects and relics that were then translated, mm. sort of echoed. Mm. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm going to answer your question, but, but you know, I'm part with Carolyn Hamilton. We 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 part of a group um, that that looks at archives, and one of the things that I'm interested in in that group is the the way in which the things that we make now um, contribute to what that archive is and what it becomes. So that so that you know, in some senses, it's not self-conscious, but in some senses, it is self-conscious that you see an absence, you see a, a, a you know an evacuation somewhere in a collection or in an archive, and in some way try to insert something into that absence. And I think you know that is in a way what I try to do with those things. I want to thank Pippa for an inspiring and marvelous presentation.